Welcome, good morning. My name is Fabio Parasecoli. I'm the director of Food Studies Initiatives here at the New School. And I'm one of the organizers of this conference uh, together with the Institute of Culinary Education, and then we'll introduce also our, our partners. We're very happy that this event happens here and at ICE. Uh, it's an uh, attempt at a collaboration across different fields. Here, you know, we do mostly uh, scholarly work, but especially in this division, uh, we work on public engagement. So we really try to tackle the urgent uh, contemporary issues of our society, and we believe that food waste is definitely one of those. And we're very happy to be uh, collaborating with a culinary education institution, because that's where you know, many of the professionals in the food business will come out in the next few years. I think it's a, it's a perfect collaboration, and we invited many uh, professionals uh, in the food business to share their experiences. We want this to be really based on um, reality, um, what's going on, you know, the cutting edge in, in food waste, and we'll have plenty of time also for you guys to ask questions and participate in the discussions. Uh, for every uh, panel, we will have a Q&A moment. Um, it so happened, somebody pointed out to me that today is actually uh, Stop Food Waste Day, you know, probably yesterday was Cinnamon Day, but today <laughs> is Stop F Food Waste Day, uh, we're very happy, just, you know, happen chance. Uh, it's the perfect time to, uh, to do this. Um, keep in mind that because of our collaborations, there will be two locations here at the new school today and tomorrow. The panels will take place at the University Center at, the, at uh, 5th Avenue and 14th Street. And in the afternoon, all the hands-on experiences will happen at ICE at 225 uh, Liberty Street, but then we will have Jenny McCoy, one of our co-organizers, to give you uh, more practical uh, information. Uh, also keep in mind that your name, uh, name tags are your passes. So this allows you to go to the different events, and if you've bought uh, afternoon experiences, you will have a little ticket also inside. Um, right now, I would like to introduce uh, Melissa Friedling, our Dean of the School of Undergraduate Studies that also would like to welcome you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for coming today. Oh, I'm gonna do this. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm the Dean of the School of Undergraduate Studies at the New School, and it's my great honor to welcome you to this conference, the Zero Waste Food Conference. Um, the New School, you may know, was founded in 1919 as a counter to, to traditional universities. Um, and so classes were open to all who might be interested in, in a coming to discuss topics focused on urgent uh, political and social issues of the day, as Fabio already mentioned, and we would serve adult men and women with an education that would able th enable them to become effective uh, and engaged citizens. The new school started offering degrees to bachelor's students in 1944 to address the educational needs of returning World War II veterans under the GI Bill. And the new school claimed that they would, they would come here to answer the question, what did we fight for? And the food studies program is part of the founding DNA of the new school and certainly a direct heir to those ideals. Um, since 2010, we've been developing a robust food studies curriculum that's that, that connects and examines the connections between food, culture, social policy, and the environment. And we offer both a major and a minor in food studies supported by rich public events like this one. Uh, we have 250 students taking food studies courses every semester and 35 um, majors, and I'm guessing that we have a bunch in the audience because, it, in fact, this, this, this conference will enable students to earn a credit for attending, participating, and reflecting on the important conversations we're going to be having over the next two days. Um, shout out if you're a new school student. Yeah, great. Um, this conference on food waste fits perfectly with the New School's focus on addressing pressing issues of the day, and particularly issues that connect design, sustainability, and social justice. And I'm pleased that this conference is an opportunity 
for scholars, entrepreneurs, culinary professionals, and public and private organizations to come together um, to discuss such urgent matters and dig deeper, connect theory and practice, and think about how design and can support better methods for the ways we produce, distribute, and consume and dispose of food in the environments that we cook and where we eat. So I would add that the connection to our community is part of our core mission at the New School, and that the Food Studies program also runs an on on, uh, culinary magazine online called The Inquisitive Eater um, in partnership with our creative writing program. And on May 15th, we're gonna launch a massive online open course on food insecurity. Um, that Fabio is going to be leading out. And thanks, I want to thank, finally thanks all of the conference organizers, um, particularly Fabio Parasecoli, B. Banyu, um, Marielle Sullivan, who's our food studies program assistant, um, also Chelsea, who's our, who's our um, events assistant, and um, they've all been working tirelessly to put this conference together, along with our amazing partners at um, Institute for Culinary Education. And um, without further ado, I'm delighted to welcome you to this conference. Thanks. Thank you, Mel. I would like to introduce Rick Smilo, the president of the Institute of Culinary Education, who will also welcome you. Uh, thank you, Fabio. And it's, uh, it's fun and a pleasure to be in this neighborhood early in the morning. My first New York City apartment was, was about a block from here, and I've been back, but not this early. I'm also uh, humored or chagrined to note that the rent for that apartment was about 400 a month, <laughs> if, if only now. Um, so this is a unique conference because two institutions have come together to address a topic that is of growing interest to our respective students, faculty, and staff. ICE is proud to be partnered with the New School's Food Studies program to present panels and workshops that promote actionable insights regarding food waste. The Institute of Culinary Education's career programs are very hands-on, practical, sophisticated, and successful in launching careers. Along the way, we try to teach values and expand our students' horizons about what it could mean to be a good citizen chef. Being aware of and addressing issues related to food waste is part of that effort. Food waste is an interesting topic because it can be addressed from the most macro to the most micro, micro levels. It's good and impressive that massive companies like Walmart and the Compass Group have food waste initiatives. Large regional companies like Baldor, who is a sponsor of this conference, are actively addressing food waste, and individual chefs like Bill Telepan, Missy Robbins, and Dan Kluger, who are part of this conference, essentially have the elimination of food waste as menu goals in their individual restaurants. My own macro observation about food waste is that it is a silent, often unnoticed problem that presents so many dimensions to improve society. I can list four. One save billions and billions of dollars of wasted food. Two, addressing food insecurity and hunger in America and the world. Three, reducing methane emissions from landfill sites that are contributing to global warming. And four, regaining public respect for agriculture and the environment. These are modest but reasonable goals, right? During these next two days, I hope that all of us will gain insight and ideas to help reach these goals. I'd like to thank all the conference sponsors, and particularly Baldor, Chef's Warehouse, and Imperial Bag and Paper. All three companies are large suppliers to ICE, and Baldor, in particular, is gaining a national reputation for its commitment to using, not eliminating, but using its food waste. Who are the representatives from Baldor here? Front row. You deserve to be. <laughs> Finally, I'd like to thank a team of staff members from ICE, including Brian Aronowitz, Jessica Mara, Amanda Gurex, and Jenny McCoy for working with Fabio and his team to make this conference possible. Thank you. Jenny, if you want to come up and take it from here. Sure. Jenny McCoy from the Institute of Culinary Education. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, I'm not an early bird, so for those of you guys who are not, I'm with you. Um, so 
again, want to thank everyone for coming and being here. And I hope you're as excited about this conference as we are, Fabio and I, um, and the rest of the team from the New School and ICE had an amazing time putting this together. And so we're so excited that it's finally here. Um, I am now going to put on my Cinderella gown and do a little bit of housekeeping for you guys. So please pay attention. I have some interesting announcements for you. Um, one is that if you didn't bring a reusable water bottle today, that's okay, there's always tomorrow. So please try to remember one um, and we can do some waste that way. Um, also, we have waste stations uh, throughout the facilities here, and then we also will at ICE, so please make sure you're disposing of things properly, and there will be people at all of those waste stations to help guide you if you're unsure. Um, also, those stations are being manned by Common Grounds Compost, so if you have any questions about waste disposal um, and you really want to get into it, please talk to anyone from Common Grounds Compost. They have lots of really interesting information for you. Um, another thing is that um, in your program are directions to ICE. Um, Brookfield Place, where we're located, is quite a big building. Um, it has an amazing food court, Hudson Eats, so if you are trying to figure out where to grab lunch, I highly recommend you head down that way and just make your way down to ICE sooner rather than later. Um, Check-in at ICE will be on the second floor at the lobby area right next to Hudson Eats Food Court. Okay, so everyone keep that in mind um, and don't accidentally find your way into Hermes and buy yourself a $400 scarf, okay? Um, <laughs> Also, um, in your little lanyards are tickets for your demos and any hands-on classes that you're taking, so please hang on to those for the next couple of days. Um, you'll need them for the various other activities that are going on. Um, and let's see, three more things, okay? Um, just so you know, the cocktail party has now been sponsored, so it's open to all of you guys. It's free. We really, really hope that you can make it. It's today at the Institute of Culinary Education from 5 to 6.30. Lots of free booze and lots of free food, so come enjoy. Um, if you're not going to a demo or have a hands-on class today at ICE, you're welcome to just come down and hang out, check out our facilities before the cocktail hour, or just show up for the cocktail hour, or whatever you want to do. Um, and tomorrow, registration starts a little bit later, 9.30, so you can get a little bit more sleep. So show up here at 9.30 tomorrow, not at 9 if you'd like. Um, also, <laughs> it's a laundry list here. Um, the Dan Kluger demonstration, which is today, your little tickets accidentally have the wrong time on them. So it's the correct time in the program. The Dan Kluger demo is from 3 to 3.45, as you guys already all planned, but the little tickets accidentally read 4.15. Okay, so it's at 3 o'clock. If anyone has any questions, just ask any one of us. Um, and then last but not least, please be sure to share all of your experiences and photographs and all that good stuff on social media, and it's hashtag zero waste food. Thank you so much for listening to me ramble on and on, and now we'll get into the nitty gritty. Uh, enjoy the conference. So I will introduce the moderator for our uh, first panel, Alan Salmek, and then he will introduce in turn the speakers. Uh, Alan has got over 35 years experience in the food industry as an owner, an operator, a consultant, and a teacher. As a matter of fact, he's a full-time instructor at the Institute of Culinary Education, and he's also an adjunct professor at the Hospitality Management Program at the New York Institute of Technology. Um, he worked extensively in fine dining operations uh, and helped develop fast casual concept. He's also a consultant for those who want to develop new food products. He's been awarded seven grants from the federal government and New York State uh, to work on sustainability issues within the hospitality uh, industry. He's organized workshops, conferences, training programs uh, for the New York State Restaurant Association and has been a speaker and author of numerous bus business articles um, on the topics. I will welcome Alex Somek to the stage to introduce uh, the speakers for our first panel. Thank you. Thank you, Fabio, uh, and welcome, everybody. Um, uh, first thing I want to say is I operated restaurants for about 25 years, and it's definitely not as romantic as people think it is. Um, the course I teach at ICE is an intensive six-month course, 12 hours a week. 
And I spend about five and a half months of that time, a couple of my students are here, uh, telling them not to do it. Uh, the other 15 days, I totally encourage them, but they're well-armed and equipped to, to run restaurants, and it's really meant for those who really have a passion about it and who are uh, fully prepared to do everything that's necessary. Um, today's topic on uh, food waste is really a critical one. The good news for the, those of us who are really interested and committed to it is that there's been more and more interest in this area for the last several years. Um, restaurants are embracing the idea. The technology is exploding. Um, I was just reading an article a couple of days ago up in Massachusetts where um, a grocery store uses an anaerobic digester and is somehow able to extract power to run one of their distribution centers. So there's all kinds of interesting, cool technology that's being developed. Um, and so uh, the idea of trying to adapt that is, is very relevant and very real. The challenges, though, are enormous. The restaurant industry, and particularly the kitchen, which is the heartbeat of every restaurant, uh, it's just a tough place to work. Um, there's a lot going on. I mean, if those of us in the industry know what it takes to put a great tasting looking plate out on the table, customers don't realize all the aspects of what goes on. And then when we add a layer of um, trying to make the kitchen more sustainable, it becomes a tough challenge for those of us in the industry. So what we're gonna talk about today with our a distinguished and very diverse panel um, is to what, what is the kitchen of the future potentially look like? Some of it is already here today. Um, we're gonna talk about the challenges that the kitchen has to overcome to be, become a sustainable kitchen that deals with the whole idea of food waste. So um, what I'd like to do is introduce each panel member and they're gonna each give a short four or five minute uh, deeper introduction about what they do. We'll have a whole list of questions for them that they're gonna discuss and the last 15 minutes or so, we'll open it up for a Q&A for the rest of the audience. Okay, so let's begin. Um, First person I'd like to introduce is James Fustel. He's currently a commercial equipment designer for Singer Equipment Company. He holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineer from the Cooper Union and a master's degree in food studies from, of all places, NYU. Um, of the, over the course of his 10 plus year career in commercial kitchen design, Mr. Fustel has designed kitchens across the country. Chicago, Napa, Hawaii, Las Vegas, Arizona, and Florida. These projects have ranged from 1,000 square foot QSRs to fine dining restaurants and casinos in Las Vegas. Two commissary, 20,000 foot commissary kitchens. Mr. Fustel's background affords him a unique approach to commercial kitchen design, one in which the integration of building systems, space planning, and operational requirements is essential to the design process. James. Okay. Um, well, all the panelists are gonna come up, and this way I'll introduce them. Um, second panelist is Elizabeth Meltz. Elizabeth is the Director of Environmental Health um, at Battalion Bastianich Hospitality Group. After graduating from college and then culinary, Elizabeth spent time working in restaurants in New York and Rome, landing ultimately at Del Posto, uh, where she quickly rose through the ranks from banquet chef to manager of kitchen operations. In 2009, Elizabeth recognized an opportunity for restaurants to better the sustainability practices of their kitchens and dining rooms and was appointed director of food safety and sustainability, really essentially a job that, that she helped create. Um, uh, Elizabeth now oversees a comprehensive health, environmental, and food safety program. In the past few years, she has been recognized by Fast Company, Bloomberg, Business Week, CNN, and the National Geographic Magazine. Elizabeth. Robert Lang 
um, Robert has a uh, farm in our school. And it's a really, uh, for, I really recommend those of you who haven't been there to come visit. It's a very unique indoor farm in downtown Manhattan. Uh, Robert has spent at least over a year now uh, working on really creating a valid and viable business model for indoor farming. So it's a fascinating uh, opportunity uh, to see how hydroponics can impact the food industry. Um, the goal is to reduce water use by around 95% and advance climate control technology to grow a wide variety of plants year-round without pesticides, pollution, so soil contamination, or herbicides. Um, and what Robert does is deliver these on bike to a lot of chefs in New York City. Um, he's the CEO of Farm One. At one point, he founded a translation tech company, and uh, he is spending all his time now trying to build this business model, and um, it's really fascinating. Finally, Sarah Brito, uh, an entrepreneur of ideas and an avowed foodie. Sarah is co-founder and president of Good Food Media, a nonprofit educational organization that produces and publishes the Good Food 100 restaurants. Sarah is a 20-year food veteran working with organizations such as the Chef's Collaborative, The Kitchen, and The New York Times. While serving on the board of Slow Food New York, she created and co-launched the Slow Food Snail of Approval program, a designation given to restaurants, bars, and food us beverage artisans that contribute to the quality, authenticity, and sustainability of the su food supply of New York City. Okay, um, and under Sarah's leadership, Chef's Collaborative was nominated for the 2016 Taste Talks inaugural Outstanding Nonprofit Award, and three of her past clients have been recognized uh, as one of the world's most innovative companies. Her work has been featured on the cover of the New York Times, and she was invited by the State Department and the James Beard Foundation to speak at the American Chef Rally in Milan, Italy. Okay, so what we're gonna do for the next few minutes, each of them are gonna come up and just give a short uh, snippet of what they do so you have a better idea, and then we'll get into the panel discussion. James? I, I promise it's a, a brief PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I'm an engineer by training, so I'm a, a big fan of numbers and figures. I promise it's just the first couple of slides. We'll get through it. It should be pretty painless. Uh, I'm a kitchen designer and an engineer by training, and uh, one of the things that we've kind of had to evolve over the last 12 years, uh, that I've been doing this at least, is, is how we deal with food waste. It used to be you just stuck in a garbage disposer or you called a compost hauling company to haul away your food waste, and that was sort of it. Uh, we also had these really absurd solutions where we'd build refrigerated rooms just to hold garbage uh, in restaurants. How many of you have seen these in restaurants before? Refrigerated trash rooms, right? So it's really energy inefficient, really expensive uh, ways of, of dealing with food waste. And you can see where most of our food waste comes, uh, 37 million tons annually. Most of it on the manufacturing and processing side, a little bit towards the right hand end you see is the restaurants. And that's primarily where my expertise is, is uh, commercial food service operations on the restaurant scale. Um, Again, a few more numbers. Uh, food waste is the most land-filled item in the United States, and we waste enough food every day to fill the Rose Bowl Stadium, uh, just to give you a sense of, of the scale of the problem that we're, we're trying to contend with. Uh, very little of our food waste is recycled or reused in, in, in any kind of way. Uh, in the commercial kitchens, spoilage prep and plate waste are really the three main sources of food waste. And then as you go up the scale from casual to fine dining, you'll see that most of the, in, in the commercial kitchen, most of the food waste that we're dealing with is on the prep side, believe it or not, uh, and very little on the spoilage side. Uh, I'm gonna skip the pyramid because I know I only have, I'm like down to three minutes, right? Um, the technologies that we, we see a lot more these days, uh, pulpers, composting, bio boxes, which are the, the bio digesters, um, with pulpers being one of the fastest growing segments of, of how we deal with food waste. And I'll explain a little bit more about how pulpers, pulpers work in a couple of slides. Um, but disposers, the, the traditional 
method and, and means of disposal everywhere except New York City, actually. You're not allowed to have a garbage disposer in New York. Um, but we're seeing pulpers, compactors, uh, composting, and bio boxes really, really growing over the last dozen years or so. Uh, the obstacles that, that I contend with on a, on a more personal level when I'm working with operators dealing with waste, we have labor intensive, uh, it's, it's very labor intensive to haul and move food waste. Odor and pest control are, are very, very big deals in restaurants. That's why we refrigerate our trash room, so we try and keep odors down. And then the emissions and hauling from, uh, from hauling waste to landfills. Uh, it's very expensive to deal with waste. Uh, it's also very expensive to, to not deal with it, too. We're talking about uh, $161 billion in the dollar value of the food that gets wasted every year. Uh, and then 17% of the methane that's emitted into the atmosphere coming from food waste and landfills. Um, just a, a, a brief survey snapshot. People want to deal with the food waste problem. That's something we're seeing at every level from just the, uh, from operations all the way down through the design and manufacturer side too. Uh, it's become very, very important to, to deal with the issue. And that's sort of my, my role, especially over the last handful of years, we're seeing more and more states enact food landfill bans. So, um, we don't have state one in Pennsylvania. I live in, uh, just outside of Philadelphia, but Philadelphia, you're not allowed to throw food in the trash. It all has to go into the garbage disposer or it has to be hauled um, away by a composter. And we're seeing more and more of those. This is just since 2010. Uh, there are now seven states, I'm sorry, 10 states with partial or full landfill uh, food waste bans. And, and it's just gonna keep becoming more and more of a, a thing that we see legislated. One more minute. Okay, so really quick, just a couple of pieces of technology that I work with on the large scale. Um, the anaerobic digesters and, and methane recapturing technology. So this is more on the manufacturing and process side. So you see the, the Walmarts and the Baldors and the Costcos use these. On the smaller side, we see the pulpers. Uh, pulper technology has really gotten a lot better where we used to put in uh, 100 pounds of, of food and get 20 pounds of pulp out. We can now put in 100 pounds of food and get 15 pounds of pulp out. So we're really able to extract more water uh, and, and minimize the amount of waste that we have. Using less water to do it. Uh, the last technology I'll talk about is the, um, the Phoenix dehydrator. So this is taking the pulper and, and just kind of putting it on steroids really is everything is pulped, everything is centrifuged, and then it goes into a very big dehydrator. Uh, and, and we're taking things, we're taking 100 pounds of waste down to 10 pounds of pulp that gets thrown in the garbage. And we'll talk more about some of these. Uh, I'll just leave you with, well, I'll get to it all later. Um, all right, thank you. Hi. This is my least favorite part of these panels because it's like when someone just asks you to describe a typical day and if your job is like mine, you don't really have a typical day. So I'm just gonna give a very brief intro into what I feel like I do and then we can flesh it out more in the panel. Um, I do food safety, sustainability, and workplace safety and I see them as very intertwined. Oh, he's not talking to me. <laughs> okay. Um, so my job is humans and regulatory compliance and running a business or building a business all rolled into one. Uh, for food safety, I deal with a lot of standard operating procedures, health department compliance, best practices, and building new facilities. So this, the, that's great. I'm fascinated by what you already said. Um, sustainability, obviously food waste is a big issue for us. Uh, packaging, building our buildings lead certified, and also dealing with new construction. How can we make it more sustainable um, when we build something? And then workplace safety is just accident prevention and keeping our staff safe. Obviously, something is not sustainable if people can't use it or use it safely or understand how to use it. Uh, the three together sort of in equal environmental health, which is what I've been calling the position. I am open to new title suggestions because food safety, sustainability, and workplace safety is too much of a mouthful. It doesn't fit on a business card. Um, and that's sort of me in a nutshell. I also want to mention that that quote that you gave, which is great, is by Jonathan Bloom, who wrote an incredible book. And if you have not read it, American Wasteland, you should go right now if you're interested. Not right now. Stay for our panel and then go. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, how do I turn this on? Oh, there we go. Okay. 
with that. Um, yeah, so as Alan mentioned, uh, Farm One is a farm right now inside the Institute of Culinary Education. So I do encourage you guys, if you have the opportunity to visit ICE, come back to the, the back of the school and see what we're doing. Um, this journey for me kind of started with the idea that I wanted to grow rare and unusual crops in the middle of the city year round. So the kind of things that where you go to the farmer's market one week and you see something that you've never had before and you taste it and it's a brand new taste, a brand new flavor, um, and you can't normally get it. I wanted to be able to grow that kind of thing year round uh, to do that sustainably and do it in the heart of cities. Um, and it's been about one, one year on now that we've been trying to tackle this kind of problem. So fundamentally, this idea of getting high quality, really interesting produce, but getting it year round. The problems that a lot of uh, restaurants and chefs and home cooks have is that uh, a lot of people growing interesting things tend to be far away. So for instance, like one of the biggest and very high quality providers of uh, interesting produce to New York restaurants is Chef's Garden, uh, which is actually all the way in Ohio. So everything has to get shipped over. Or commonly, you might be getting things from California or even further afield. Uh, a lot of the time, uh, for interesting produce as well, people are using pesticides, or you can't really trust whether or not they're using them. Um, and this supply can often be pretty seasonal. So. What we did was last year in April, it's almost exactly a year, uh, we installed at ICE. And on the left-hand side, you can see a little picture of our farm. It's very small. So compared to most agriculture, it's like a tiny little blip. Um, but we planted our first crops uh, just after we arrived. We started to sell to chefs. And really, our sales method is like grow a box of stuff, bring it to a chef, have them taste it. That's it. It's very, very simple. Um, and, but by sort of October last year, we had already sold out. And so not that many customers, but already sold out of that kind of space. <clears throat> and what we've been doing over the past few months is now building a larger farm in Tribeca. And so that's about to launch uh, in the next few weeks. That's about 10 times larger than what we have at ICE. So still not really huge by agricultural standards, uh, but a big step up for us. The kind of produce that we grow is really kind of interesting, unusual things. And we try to present that like through our Instagram, et cetera. Uh, so things like Nepotella, which is one of my favorites. Has anyone heard of Nepotella here? A couple of people. Yeah, so that's a Tuscan herb. It's a little bit like an oregano or a mint. It has these beautiful little pink flowers, something that most of the time you're just not going to come across. We also grow uh, edible flowers in general, like wood sorrel. We grow, grow this beautiful purple oxalis, which is sour and kind of looks like a butterfly. Uh, you'll see on there, on the second image, we have ice plant, which is a very succulent kind of diamond kind of crystalline sort of herb. Uh, it's beautiful. Um, and we sell really to the top end. And so uh, we're looking at kind of Michelin star restaurants, that kind of fine dining. Um, and definitely what we're doing on such a small scale allows us to be very precise in terms of production. So almost everything growing in that farm has someone's name on it. So the idea of food waste for us is always like a business problem. We don't really want to be growing anything that isn't already pre-allocated to a customer. And then got some animations. Don't know why I did it that way. There we go. Um, and so everything on the farm is absolutely tracked from seed to harvest. Um, and we've built technology around that so our farm hands can actually tag things and follow them through the process. And if you receive something at the restaurant, in theory, you could actually go back and, and see uh, that thing being planted on the farm. And then the way that we deliver is kind of uh, pretty unusual, too. Because we're hyper-local, we're right in the middle of Manhattan. So we're about 20 minutes away from most of our customers, which means we deliver on the bike, we deliver on the subway, we have the little backpacks, that's it. So we don't have to store the food in any way. It's cut, and then it'll, it can, in theory, end up on someone's plate within a couple of hours, uh, which is pretty radical. <clears throat> And then the last thing is, what we've developed with our customers is actually reusable packaging. And so instead of having a clamshell that someone's going to throw away or have to recycle, um, <clears throat> we deliver them. Actually, it's like a hotel pan. Um, and then they'll keep that for the week. And then we go and pick it up the next time we come. So kind of zero waste there. Uh, pretty much if we throw something out on the farm, it's either a plant that goes into the compost, or occasionally if something breaks, uh, we'll have to throw it out. But apart from that, uh, it's pretty much zero waste food. And I think that's me. Thank you. Thank 
Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here today uh, because my journey into the food world actually started a block away from here uh, as well, similar to Rick, although my rent was a little higher <laughs> than yours at the time. Um, and it actually started in this auditorium. I was just reflecting on that on my walk over today because I used to uh, take all of these workshops here, like how to open a coffee shop, how to open a bar or restaurant, as I was exploring all of the potential ways that I could get uh, involved in food and, and work my way out of the branding and marketing uh, world. And so if any of you have any career questions afterwards, I'm, I'm happy to chat with you. Um, but I'm, I'm here today, and my journey into food, and uh, I think the uh, perspective that I'm going to offer on the panel and in our conversation today uh, really is an outgrowth or an evolution of my work that I did with Slow Food New York City in co-creating the Snail of Approval, um, and my most recent work with Chefs Collaborative, uh, which is a wonderful national network of chefs and restaurants who all care about sustainability and care about how they source, uh, cook, and serve food. Um, but today I'm here uh, representing uh, my new venture. Uh, I'm the co-founder of the Good Food Media Network, which is a nonprofit, and we're the publishers of the Good Food 100 restaurants. And you might be wondering, you know, well, I've, I've never heard of that. And there's a reason for that. We just launched in February of this year, and our first list is scheduled to be published in mid-June um, of this year. Um, but just to give you an overview of what the Good Food 100 uh, restaurants is all about, we're a new uh, annual national survey uh, that is designed to educate eaters and celebrate chefs and restaurants and food service companies for being transparent with their purchasing practices. And this is unique um, because we are the first um, of, our, of its kind uh, survey and list uh, that is based on objective standards. And what I mean by that is our list, uh, the standard to get on our list is based on actual purchases of good food in the prior year. So we're actually measuring quantitative uh, food purchasing data from restaurants. And the criteria is very transparent. We're comparing what your total food purchases are to the percentage of those food purchases that you allocate towards the good food economy. And we define what good food is, good food producers, good food purveyors, um, by category. And so the premise of this, and what I believe, um, just to put it out there and then we can elaborate further in our conversation, I believe that two things are really gonna drive the future of the sustainable kitchen. And those two things, to me, are transparency and technology. I believe transparency is going to be critical because eaters are going to drive that agenda. Eaters, including all of us. We all need to eat to live. And eaters want to know where their food is coming from. And so I know we're here to talk about waste, um, but we first have to measure where we are today and understand where we are in order to know where we want to go. And to me, that starts with knowing and measuring where our food is coming from. Uh, the second thing is that uh, according to a recent USDA study, almost 50% of the dollars spent on food in the United States is spent away from home. So I know sometimes, especially in New York City, we often talk about eating out as being an activity of the 1%. Um, but when we talk about eating away from home, we're not just talking about eating in fine dining restaurants. We're talking about every purchase that we make when we're away from home. So that's quick service restaurants, fast casual restaurants. It includes... Um, uh, universities, uh, dining services, it includes corporate cafeterias. And so we have the potential to impact uh, and make a positive impact on that 50, almost 50% 50 spend uh, of food dollars that happens outside of the home. In addition to that, chefs and restaurants, I believe, uh, for all sorts of reasons, including the rise of the Food Network, uh, the James Beard Awards, have more power and influence than ever. And eaters trust chefs and restaurants. But with that trust and power, 
um, also comes the risk of falling from grace. And so all it takes is one negative news story uh, as we uh, learned, many of you might be familiar with uh, an article that appeared in the April 2016 Tampa Bay Times titled Farm to Fable. Uh, the New York Times then went on to write that every time we eat, we are being lied to. And so again, I think that transparency is going to be critical uh, as we move forward. And lastly, I'll say that eaters, because of the proliferation of choices, of where to eat and how to spend their money and what's being told to them are looking to lists and independent third-party organizations to evaluate and rate their choices to help them navigate uh, the confusion um, and the concern and the worry that they have about where their food is coming from. So I look forward to sharing that perspective on the panel this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks to our panel. Um, I think uh, one of the things is you got a real representative uh, look at all the aspects of trying to manage food waste, from uh, technology to marketing to having people involved in key positions to handle it all to production. It, it's really a full scope um, way of looking at it because food waste is not just not going to happen without all the different aspects we've talked about. So let's just get into our panel. Um, first question for our panel. Um, in terms of sustainable and energy efficient kitchens, there are many technological solutions out there uh, to support the success of that. How do we get the hospitality industry to catch up with technology? And this is especially true for the small operator, the one person uh, owner of a cafe who doesn't have the resources, uh, let's say, that a big restaurant group has. How do we get them on board? So who wants to take a stab at that first? Oof. Elizabeth? Uh, um, does that work? Can you hear me? OK. Um, I. This is always a hard question for me to answer because I don't work for a small restaurant group and I always feel you know, somewhat privileged to have the support that I have. Uh, but I always try to keep that in mind when thinking about what we're able to do versus if you're a mom and pop. Um, this is a tough one. I mean, technology is not my focus. I think that there's a lot going on in, um, in food waste as far as regulations are concerned, as far as panels and discussions and conferences like this are concerned, where there can be outreach to smaller mm -hmm. restaurant owners um, to learn about this and adapt. Does anybody else want to rescue me here? <laughs> <laughs> um, there used to be a great program in New York called NYSERDA, and I'm not sure if it still, it still exists. exists. Yeah, it still exists. So okay. <laughs> Years ago, I'd heard they were running out of funding, um, and then sort of went away, but I guess they're back. It'd be great to get organizations like that on board, because I think, uh, you know, Energy Star is fantastic. Water conservation is great. I think once we start legislating and, and providing rebates for not wasting food, uh, I think we'll be able to involve a lot more small operators. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, the technology used to be we would tell an operator that it was seven years before a system was going to pay for mm -hmm. itself. Uh, and that's just an insane, an insanely long time for a small business owner to look, look that far down the road. Um, a lot of the technologies, and, and like any other technology that's out there, it's gotten a little bit cheaper over time a little bit less expensive. So the return on investment, still, it's still up there, but it's now in the three to four year range. And I think, I think going out and, and hopefully pitching operators with that too will we'll sort of get them so to buy it. So essentially the technology can help if it, the incentive is strong enough. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sarah? I would also add, um, just anecdotally, from this survey that we just conducted, um, one I want to acknowledge that I think it is a challenge for small operators right now, and we saw that in our survey because you have restaurants that are on the paper system with invoices. And I had one chef, for example, um, send me a photograph of his invoices spread all across his bar um, during the day pre-service in order to take our survey. And he's like, look at what I'm doing for you to take this survey. Um, and then others are on QuickBooks and things like that um, that make tracking purchases easier. But I think the key is demonstrating that 
technology is going to help them run their business. I think it is so challenging for restaurants to just do the basics of keeping their doors open that anything that is seen as a distraction um, is not going to make it to the top of uh, at the top of their to-do list. You have to show how it's ultimately going to maybe help reduce food costs or things like that um, to get them uh, to actually get on board. Okay, terrific. Um, Rob, anything to add? I'm good right now. <laughs> okay, um, going back to you, Elizabeth. Even though you have a, you're part of a bigger organization. What have you seen works in terms of getting it in, in, involved in the culture where the sustainable practices become part of the everyday norm instead of just something on the side? What challenges did you face um, and, and how did you overcome some of those? Um, that's a great question when it comes to food waste also because I think that there's a lot of things that are included in a, in a chef's education or in a... In, in the kitchen practices, you know, you wouldn't um, you wouldn't forget to clock in, or you wouldn't bad touch your neighbor. Why are you wasting food, right? Like the, it should be in the DNA. The the idea that we are um, we should be paying attention to where our food waste goes, or how much we're wasting, or why we're wasting it, should be part of the job. Whereas right now, I feel like every time I introduce a new technology to assess food waste, it's like oh, another thing I have to do. Even if you care, like Sarah just said, you've got so many things that you've got to do, so now this is just an additional responsibility. It should just be the fiber of your job description to begin with. Um, that being said, I think that coming from a kitchen background has been hugely helpful for me um, in integrating some of this stuff, and I never, ever bring a new technology or even a new chemical or a new pre-rinse spray aerator or anything into the kitchen without running it by the people who use it first. So if it's a new chemical, I get some, they sample it. If it's a new technology, I give it to the guy who actually takes out the garbage, I, and we translate it into Spanish so that he can understand it, and then he says, take out this column, take out that column. And that's the only, for me, that's the only way to move forward with a lot of these things. Okay. Anybody else want to comment on that? Yeah, I think, you know, as, as you were saying, I, I think it has to become part of culture, and. The advantage that some newer organizations might have is that they can build that in from the start, um, and it becomes less of an add-on to an organization. And I think that applies you know, in restaurants. It also applies in bigger companies. So if you see, say, ExxonMobil doing a CSR initiative, you, you kind of have to wonder, like, is that really, really uh, something they believe in? You know, my experience has been in startups, and I think one of the nice things that startups can do is kind of reinvent everything as they go along. And so, you know, as we grow, we can choose packaging uh, based on sustainability. We can choose, like, how we wash things. We can choose all that. We have the chance to do it from the ground up. And so I think some of these changes, uh, they, they may take a while, but the lucky thing is there are new organizations coming in all the time that are able to build that in uh, where that it's not even a choice anymore. It's just like, oh, this is how we do it. This is how we've been doing it from, from day one. Yeah. Um, going back to what I was saying at the beginning about eaters having power, mm -hmm. I think that um, you know any consumer-focused business um, responds to the marketplace, and so if eaters uh, demand uh, that restaurants and food businesses start caring about food waste, start asking questions, uh, watch how quickly the chefs and restaurants respond, um, because ultimately, um, if it doesn't matter to eaters and uh, they're not getting credit for the practices that they're doing, and it, they're not necessarily seeing a quantifiable um, contribution to the bottom line, then over time it's really hard to um, build it into the culture. And in my experience, I mean, I can't speak for all of you, but almost no one comes into a restaurant and says, I'll have the fish, what do you do with your food waste? Or, or do, you yeah, have a, yeah. do you have a donation program in place? I mean, I know it's awkward, but you know, that, that's the message we get is that Nobody's asking about that. And I think, there's a, I think there's a missed opportunity on the educational side, too. I've never seen a cost controls textbook address food waste. It's always edible product minus trim, and, and you, never, you never learn about what to do with that trim. It costs money to haul that away or process it or turn it into something. So you know, maybe there's an opportunity to talk about real costs on the educational side and sort of make that part of uh, you know, the, the syllabus or the curricula of, of any graduates going out there and opening restaurants. I hear a new class coming <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I thought of this question coming in today. I thought it'd be interesting to hear your take on it. I think in this country, we're used to large portions of food, and that, I think, definitely contributes to food waste. Is it a responsibility or a challenge to try uh, to deal with people's mentality around food portions? Um, as someone who's British, you might be able to tell. <laughs> um, but also, having lived in Japan for eight years, like I'm always astonished here. Like, astonished at the size of the portions and the way that people are happy to leave half the plate. Um, I, you know, my experience in Japan has been you get exactly as much as you're going to eat and you'll clean that rice bowl. And that's such a hard cultural thing to change. I, I don't know how exactly you do it, but um, I just have to say I totally agree with you. And, like, wow. Yeah. I think it was Jonathan Bloom who I mentioned before who said, you know, in America, we give people an option to either overeat or to waste half their food. Um, again, luckily I work for a sort of an, an Italian or European mentality based company, so I feel like our portion sizes are a little bit more reasonable, but I think people have to, there's like a, there's like a war against leftovers, right? I don't know why people can't just take it home and eat it later or eat it the next day. We have to, um, we, in America we have to get better about that. Well, this uh, comment isn't even coming from me. I can just share with you, um, having just surveyed hundreds of chefs across the country in restaurants, that um, I can say the overwhelming sentiment from, and of course it's a self-selected group of people who opted in to take this self-reported survey, um, but I can say the overwhelming sentiment is that they believe that they have a responsibility um, on food waste and on many other issues. And I think that they feel that way because they understand the power that and influence that they have been offered. And chefs are more than just chefs. Um, I'm sort of uh, quoting uh, Mark Vetri in Philadelphia when I say this, but he said recently that being a chef is uh, no longer about just cooking. Mm -hmm. And I think that chefs and restaurants understand that they are community leaders. And as anyone who is perceived as a community lever leader, uh, you are looked up to as a role model. And so they understand that they should be modeling the types of behaviors that we want people to have at home. And we know that people learn things in restaurants. You know, I grew up in upstate New York and I grew up on iceberg lettuce. <laughs> Um, and I had to move to New York City and learn in the 90s what mesclun right? lettuce was. <laughs> so you learn new behaviors um, and ways of being in restaurants when you're away from home. Yeah. I, I thought Velveeta was cheese. <laughs> <laughs> um, it almost seems like the role of the restaurant has radically changed over time. Where in the used to be you, you just serve a good meal. Now you're connected to a social responsibility. <laughs> And with that being said, with all the technology that's being innovative, especially in the kitchen uh, and on, in the dining room, um, do, do restaurants have a responsibility around items such as job security? Let's say we come up with this great technology that eliminates four jobs in the kitchen. Is that something that restaurateurs need to consider? Or, I mean, is there a limit to the social responsibility that an operator has? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote another chef. I, I sort of feel like I'm just a medium for uh, sharing insights from the different chefs I get to work with. Um, and in this case, I'm quoting uh, Michael Leviton, who uh, is the former chef and owner of Lumiere in Massachusetts. And he also is the former board chair of Chefs Collaborative. And yeah, I love what Michael said when he said that the first um, step in running a sustainable restaurant is to keep the doors open. And so... You know, it, it sounds like a contradiction of what I just said, that you're a community leader and a role model and that you have to, you know, uh, set all these uh, positive behaviors. But at the end of the day, restaurants are businesses and they have to achieve profit and they're operating on very small margins. So it is hard to do all things um, and that I think we have to, sometimes when we're at conferences like this, talking about sustainability, um, we get into this very black and white mode. You're either sustainable or you're in it for the money. Totally. And I think we have to get out of that black and white either or thinking and understand that making money is part of the sustainable equation. If the doors aren't open, nobody has a job. Right. So, right. Uh, absolutely. Um, and similarly, how I feel about the, the three things that I do, how they come together, sustainability is about like being able to use it, being able to use it healthily and, and safely and, and having a job, a place to go 
to use whatever it is. I mean, it's, it's true. And it, my entire job is about the balance between running a business and trying to be sustainable. So that gray comment is crucial. And, and maybe there's an opportunity for, because we're talking about positions that if they're gonna be eliminated are, are, are pretty low level positions. We're talking about dishwashers and porters uh, and, and really kind of back, like low level back of house positions. Maybe there's an opportunity there for those dishwashers and porters to become prep cooks, right. to move up the line. It frees up time to you know, move up the, the ladder a little bit. So I, I think the creative destruction aspect of it is, you know, it's something we think about, but I think there's a lot of positive that can come out of it. Okay. Um, well, why not move into politics? Okay. Um, <laughs> this administration uh, is um, obviously uh, wanting to cut back on regulations, on a lot of things that may impact <clears throat> initiatives that the EPA has taken around the sustainability. Um, is there a way of dealing with that from a restaurant standpoint, even though you're a lone operator uh, or a small group, um, how do you uh, impact uh, the larger picture, which certainly could impact um, what you're trying to do? Well, from a, from a broad perspective, I think the nice thing is that politics, <clears throat> politics can't beat technology, you know? Mm -hmm. So you can have a very retrograde kind of administration, but ultimately, the, you know, the price of LEDs, the price of the technology that you were talking about earlier, that's going down, it's becoming more accessible. So regardless, um, you know, if I have the choice of choosing a particular lighting that's more efficient or something that's not, I'm gonna choose the, the one that actually makes sense. And commercially, those ecological choices now are becoming more and more affordable. Um, and so I like to think that despite the current administration, uh, you know, the trends that we're already seeing and the choices that are becoming easier are going to continue to be. Um, and so people who want to make good choices uh, over the next few years are going to continue to be able to do that. I can't, I can't speak about this administration. <laughs> <laughs> I'll add that there's things you can do in your business and within the four walls of your restaurant, and there are definitely things that chefs, restaurants, and business owners can do beyond. And I think... Um, what the James Beard Foundation is doing with their impact programs and uh, what Food Policy Action, led by Tom Colicchio, are doing to um, help facilitate and empower chefs and restaurants to have a voice beyond their four walls, beyond their immediate communities, uh, and with elected officials um, is great um, for those chefs that you know want to do that. But again, I think that that will always be a self-selected group of people that you know, in addition, going back to the challenges of just running their business and keeping their doors open, um, want to go to Washington um, like a bunch of chefs were there uh, yesterday uh, advocating uh, for policy changes. Okay. Yeah, I, just, I know some of the manufacturers that I spoke to of, of some of this equipment that I showed when I saw them at, at trade shows in Orlando uh, just a couple months ago were a little bit concerned about some of the rollbacks because it just hurts the image of, of, of their equipment. So now why does an operator, if, if we're no longer really concerned about these environmental protections and what's happening, why do we have to spend all this money? Yes, the technology is getting cheaper, but um, there's an image problem that some of the manufacturers are concerned about. Okay. Um, I'd like you to put on your um, imagination hats for a second, and why don't each of you talk a little bit of the ideal kitchen of the future? Um, what what are some of the things that we would see in a sustainable kitchen that manage food waste, some of the techniques and strategies, and, and how that would work? Uh, sure. Um, you know, it's not quite a Jetsons-like vision that I had for the, the restaurant feature, but I do see, and, and I don't think we'll ever see a zero footprint uh, restaurant, but I think uh, I, I'm hopeful about the way things are going with energy recovery, with uh, wastewater recovery, with zero, uh, in moving towards zero food waste and, and food waste recovery. Um, I really see uh, you know, being able to take a restaurant and, and make it almost carbon and environmentally neutral. Um, that's something I have a, a pretty, big, uh, pretty big hope for. Um, I, despite all this talk about technology, I also think that the human this is a personal opinion that the human component is really important. You know, this ordering from iPads is just, that's not the restaurant I want to be in. Um, so I think it's got to be a balance between the, the human element um, 
and the creative and that, that nature and Im improving the technology to, to work together. There was something else I wanted to say, but go on and then I'll come back if I think of it. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I can speak more towards the production side, I think, than what goes on in the restaurant. I think, obviously, there's a responsibility there to be efficient. Um, in terms of production, you know, what we're doing is, is trying to be, obviously, as local as possible and, and reduce that delivery chain, reduce the requirement to store food. Um, and, you know, part of that is about transparency, as we were talking about earlier. I think, you know, the ability to see exactly where that food has come from, the conditions in which it were grown, the conditions that workers have to work in when they're producing that food uh, will be increasingly important. I think that we've got to remember that the actual footprint of a restaurant operation comes from all the sourcing of all the produce that's coming into that establishment. And so, when you're eating a dish, you know, uh, if you're eating uh, like a rice bowl with vegetables versus you're eating uh, some prime steak or a piece of tuna, the actual overall impact of that meal is dramatically different. And so I think mindfulness about that uh, has to be part of the restaurant of the future. Um, and consumer choices, I think, gradually are starting to reflect that uh, as well. Definitely. The, the diner plays a role in that. We're, we're working with zero food print, which measures the entire carbon footprint of your restaurant, and then you try to reduce it or offset it. But one of the things is people need to understand that lamb is worse for the environment than a vegetable, for example, depending on how the vegetable, I mean, I'm not getting into the, but there's, there's got to be like either true cost accounting or, mm -hmm. or it's just, you know, traceability. People, we need people to understand that if we want to get there, we have to either pay for it or make, pay for it either financially or through your diet or however you want to do it. I think um, building on what these two just said, I think restaurants are preservers of humanity. <laughs> um, there's a quote about, you know, a, a society that doesn't care about the arts is a society in decline. I think that a society that doesn't care about food and its impact on agriculture and where it's coming from in the ecosystem is a society in decline. And so I think that it's not so much the the eating that happens in a restaurant, again, that sometimes brings us to the 1%, but it's about understanding that what's on that plate is having a dramatic impact on an ecosystem, which is about humans and animals and livelihood and social justice and all of these other issues. And so to me, not surprisingly, I think that it's about transparency through the supply chain because I can tell you one of the areas that's a challenge right now that we're hoping to make some progress on with this survey is the role that distributors play in the um, sort of uh, opaqueness of the supply chain. And so it's easy to point the finger and say distributors are part of the problem, but I believe that they're also part of the solution. That if distributors are more transparent and we can make that connection back to the ecosystem, back to the land, back to the farmer, rancher, fisherman, then we can preserve uh, the humanity um, in our food. Okay, terrific. Um, all right, I, I have one last question, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, part of being successful as a restaurant operator is being able to deliver your message, your marketing. Uh, it's been proven over and over again, given a choice, people would rather spend their dollars with businesses that they feel are doing good for the world or society. Uh, how do you deliver a sustainable message as a restaurant without being self-serving and uh, preachy? Um, I'll start with this. This is a huge challenge for us. We, you know, we don't want a menu full of like your chicken's name is Bob and he came from here. Like people, there's only so much information, um, and people only get the information from the website if they go to the website. Um, we've already spent the last hour talking about how servers and staff are already have four thousand things to remember, and now they've got to come to your table and promote sustainability. Maybe you're not interested. Maybe you are. So this is definitely a challenge. Um, certainly, social media helps. Definitely, training is you know the more information you can get out. But it's also really, when it comes to sustainability in particular, it's finding out what's important to the people that work for you and linking sustainability to that, as opposed to me going in and being like, you should care because I care and it's just the right thing to do. Finding out like, you know, maybe something from your culture or your background or things you're dealing with at home that relate to sustainability and then you can bring them forward. But it's, it's time consuming and it's a huge challenge for me, I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, I think there's also this, um, 
kind of difference between a fine dining meal mm -hmm. and say a fast casual. And, and I think that you know people like uh, maybe something like Sweet Green have been pretty effective at like promoting local sourcing and promoting sort of sustainability. Um, and people seem a bit more ready to accept that for lunchtime and then in the evening maybe they kind of forget about it a little bit. Um, so I think that's a challenge for, you know, a fine dining establishment saying, you know, we're going to promote like an exciting experience while still making people mindful. That's probably the trickiest part in my view. Um, but definitely, I think that relates very much to brand and how brand can help kind of encompass a whole load of kind of social impact. So whether it's about like sustainable sourcing or pesticide free or or um, worker, worker rights, that kind of thing. A brand, if it's effective, can kind of cover off all, that thi all those things and make it a little bit simpler uh, for a consumer instead of having to like go down the list, as you were saying, and every item on the menu has a sustainability aspect to it. Well, that's not surprising. Um, <laughs> my perspective is that you know, independent uh, third party awards, accolades, certifications, ratings, really go a long way. Um, and I think that you, you know, we've seen that with uh, the fact that whenever a chef writes their bio, they write whether they've received a James Beard Award, or they write if they were a food and wine best new chef. And I think what we're hoping to do is not to replace those awards. Those are important and meaningful awards. Um, but to round them out to start to tell a fuller or whole story about food um, so that you can take into account if someone has won those awards, but then also through our rating system, know if they're truly putting their money where their mouth is. And we want to recognize and celebrate chefs who are um, really walking their talk when it comes to supporting good food. And I, I think every, we're in New York City, so I'm, I'm sure everyone's been to one, but we've all been to a restaurant with an open kitchen mm -hmm. to see how our, our, our food is prepared. I think it would be great to see a kitchen with an open window into how our food is disposed of. Um, Good way to end. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have uh, the two mics at the end of the stage. Uh, please come up and uh, direct your questions to the panel. Nobody has no, any no questions. No questions? Okay. Yeah, here we go. Good. You can just. How are you? Um, my name is Gerardo Soto. I represent a company called Food Waste Experts, and we've been trading. Um, we've been helping our clients to treat food waste using different technologies, and there are technologies out there: waste poppers, anaerobic digestion, anaerobic digestion, even that's all. Many of them. So one of the things that I would like to hear is, what is that future <coughs> that the you guys? or you chefs want to see in terms of food waste, it's always going to be food waste. We're not going to be able to get away with that. So what's the ideal way in order to get rid of food waste where it is financially feasible, it does not take a lot of time, and at the end of the day, we're doing some things that we're giving back to the environment that we can. I mean, we understand enough that the market um, I would love to see anaerobic digestion used to power restaurants, communities, whatever. That, I mean, that's where I think, I always say that I think that food waste should be what vegetable oil, what fryer oil was 10 years ago, right? It's, you know, if we're not using it to do something, we are just throwing it away and it has a viable um, avenue. So I would love to see that. It's, but it's, comp, you know, we're talking about like retrofitting an existing restaurant, um, it's hard. I'm sure you can speak even, you know, more to that. And and some of this technology is huge. And when you have a small 13 table restaurant, so really trying to find that balance between the two. But I, I think that it is moving in that direction. And I think it's going to take some community organizing. Also, you can't just be like Casamono wants to run on its own food waste. They're going to have to work with the people around them to to make that happen. Uh, and, and just to add to that, I think uh, I think the the. The restaurant of the future needs to deal with food waste as part of the process and not at the end of the process. So we need to be we need to be thinking about what our prep cook is doing with the onion peels or carrot peels if he's not throwing them in the stock pot. So how do we handle them at that moment in time instead of just throwing it in the garbage pail and dealing with it later? Uh, and I think there are some companies out there who are really kind of looking at you know whether it's like portable grinding stations or um, you know remote pulping stations where we put it in and it gets vacuumed to somewhere else in process like I, I think is when it's part of the process and not the end of the process I think that's that's when it'll be really really uh, beneficial 
Okay, uh, let's go on this side. Yeah. Question. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. <laughs> Speak a little more into the microphone. Yeah. You mentioned that you believe startups can be the opportunity to introduce a new idea that can really scale up from a larger market. So my question is how do you see the work you're doing at Form One, which is addressing food waste to a very niche market, scale up to some of the larger food distribution markets? Yeah, absolutely. I mean right now we're going for that like one percent of the one percent, so absolutely. <laughs> Um, but I do think that what we're doing uh, in particular is we're trying to figure out how to farm in small spaces in the middle of the city. So our new farm is in a basement. That basement wasn't really going to be used for anything. Um, you know, we're trying to figure out how do you, it's like working in a small restaurant kitchen, right? Like how do you actually do that and store the food and cut it and like how do you do all those operations in a small space? So a lot of the uh, sort of processes and techniques that we're figuring out for this kind of fancy high-end produce, we believe that as LED technology gets a lot cheaper, so it's roughly halving in cost every four years, as it gets cheaper, um, other people or ourselves can apply those same techniques, those same pieces of technology to growing things that are a lot more kind of accessible for everybody. So, you know, my dream is in five or ten years' time, uh, it'll be actually affordable and reasonable enough for like your local bodega to, in their basement, maybe be growing um, some greens or some herbs or some other produce that could be sold there. And that, I think, is incredibly empowering because it means that food production can be all over the city. And it doesn't have to be coming from Mexico or California. Uh, it doesn't have to be shipped in. But also that food is actually, again, part of the community. So as we used to a long time ago, growing things in our backyards or sharing food that way, uh, technology can allow us to do that. That's my dream. Okay, great. Over here. Hi. Um, so I'm the operations coordinator for Food for Free, which is an organization uh, outside of Cambridge, which is outside of Boston. Um, so we focus on anti-hunger um, and anti-waste, but doing rescue and redistribution. So in talking about the ideal kitchen for the future, I noticed that it was kind of like, let's um, source from you know farm one, um, which I'm also wondering if like you guys plan on doing like regular like red leaf lettuce, where it's you know more people are going to use that than a rare um, herb. But I'm wondering when thinking about the future kitchen, how about um, using rescued food from Whole Foods or Trader Joe's? Like why don't we repurpose that? Um, so for our organization, like we go and we pick that up and then we give it to um, shelters and pantries and other organizations like that. But if thinking about a kitchen, it seems like this is about restaurants and environment. Um, where is that? There's a gap there that's not being talked about. Do you mean purchasing, you know, ugly produce or? Well, yeah, I mean, not even necessarily purchasing it because if, you know, Whole Foods is tossing it, then if there's a rescue organization, then that's, you know, there's that that connector there. I don't know if there's another panel. I well, think that's talking about it too. But yeah, okay, there's a lot of work being then. done. Yeah. No, but no, it's a great yeah. point because I mean, I think most of the people in this room probably know there's also a stigma attached to donation. Mm -hmm. Like you know, there's never been a lawsuit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a Good Samaritan Act that covers it. People should be donating. Yeah. In Italy, we're very, we're, we're, we do a very good job of it. At our restaurants, it's much harder because we cook to order. So it's not yeah. like giant trays of lasagna. <laughs> I knew that was going to happen, or 80 loaves of bread. Um, so, but it is an important part of this conversation. And you know, you skipped over that the, the pyramid. I don't know if you can bring that up in the beginning. Would you mind trying to bring it up? Uh, yeah, can, can I, because it's yeah, a real, the EPA hierarchy. If you're not familiar with it, is very important to this whole conversation. Which mm -hmm. is that you know, if, if you can't reduce it at the source, i.e., don't bring it in the house in the first place if you're not going to use it. Mm -hmm. I believe the next one is to food, feed people, then feed animals, or turn it into fuel. Mm -hmm. Then you get to compost. Then you get to landfill. So that really should be part of the DNA. There you go. Yeah. So if you're not familiar, this is like key to this whole conversation, right? So if you if you're not if you if you can't use it, the first thing you should be doing is using it to feed hungry people, and we really need to get better about that and figure out. There's a lot of apps and things out there now, like Spoiler Alert and Pair Up, and people trying to fix that problem. I don't think we've quite gotten there, but mm -hmm. I'm confident we are. Okay. Wow. Let's a uh, couple more questions. So, you know, we hear about technologies. Um, there is the most basic way in the world to store lands. And I know there's another panel on this. Uh, and I just want to address that even here, actually. There's a huge problem with that here. And I've actually talked to him about it. In every one of those phases, there is food waste. And compost is not at the bottom. Compost is what makes all of that other possible. So either there's an 
overarching band on that pyramid or in between each one. And those, you know, in order to deal with a food shed, you know, I'm asking chefs, so I have a couple of pretty big chefs who take me on time order essentially at this point. Um, and where the change is really happening is at the chef level, pushing back on their management of waste companies and management of their haulers to say you have to act responsibly because we're the client. And how willing are they all of you to pick up that phone and say that? Because there are systems we can develop to address all that waste for you, but we need to capture it. And that's one of the big conversations out there about the restaurant industry. I would say that the soil conversation is a, is a huge part of this that I don't, that I think some chefs are starting to understand, but that um, from a very basic food waste level, you're right, compost should be in between or along the side, but as far as speaking very simply about what you should do, what, how you should be thinking about the food that you've left over, it should not be going to, the landfill is the last resort, and I think um, we have a uh, very complicated relationship. We have a great relationship with our Carter, but they, I mean, this is a whole other conversation about how trash hauling works and how we pay more money to get our compost taken away than we do for our trash, which is a problem I'm sure Elizabeth Balkins in the next panel, maybe she's going to talk about it. You know, why, that's a citywide problem. I mean, my com it should be cheap for me, almost free for me to send my compost and expensive for me to send my landfill. But right now, I have to convince our owners to pay the extra to get the compost taken away. So that is an, a total mindset shift that needs to happen, shift that needs to happen as far as the way we regard that. Does, I mean, Right. Yes. I'll come to that table. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I want to move on. We have two quick last questions, and Thank then you. We, we have to wrap it up. I think that, um, you know, we have kind of the cleanest growing environment imaginable. Um, you know, our method of pest control is essentially prevention, and then we do use some beneficial insects. So in terms of, like, pesticide use, everything like that, if you walk into the farm, it's almost closer to a laboratory, I guess you'd say, than a traditional farm. So in terms of cleanliness, I think we're in a really good place. The USDA at the moment, I think, you know, if you look at their broad remit, the kind of thing I'm doing is kind of a tiny little speck on that horizon. Um, although I think that um, gradually, as you'll see, um, this is certainly happening in the Netherlands. Um, it's happening in some places here. People are trying to do this stuff on a really big scale. So Aero Farms, for instance, in New Jersey, there's a new company called Bowery here as well. They're trying to do the large scale lettuce production. Um, and you know, one of the reasons they're trying to do that is if you have this completely indoors in a controlled environment, your ability to control pathogens, pests, uh, cleanliness, process is dramatically in increased, and you can do that year round. Um, I don't really know if anyone uh, at the at the top level of the USDA is really trying to look at this, but certainly there is someone specifically for New York uh, named Ian Marvey, and he's he's responsible for kind of city city farming, and so they're certainly starting to look at it. Uh, that's all I know, I think. That's great that there's someone in place at least to start looking yeah. at it, so yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, one last question. Hi, my name is Janet. I'm an ICE student. Um, my question to you is about accountability. You mentioned how um, we as a consumer should be able to trust the restaurant, right, and go in. So lately, I've been sitting down at a menu and saying, seeing local, and saying, so what farm is this from? So where did you get this cheese? Who is this supplier? And um, several times I've gotten, let me go check with the chef. 
and they come back and they say, um, we're sorry, but we usually get it from so-and-so, but we can't right now. Uh, we ran out of that, so we've supplied something, you know, we've uh, replaced it with something else. So where is the accountability in that? If, you want, if we want the consumer to go into the restaurant and trust, who's going to oversee that accountability? I mean, I would say just by asking that question, you are enforcing that right now. I mean, if nobody asks that, then I, I, I don't think chefs are purposely, you know, replacing things. But if it seems like nobody cares, then they're not going to care. We kind of talked about that. You asking that question and that server being like, oh, and that chef saying, oops, and then going back to you and having to say that to you is going to start that. It's going to be dominoes. But we all need to do it. Okay. Yeah, and, and there's a reality of the business. Right, I mean, right. if the oops keeps happening, that's right. different than occasionally. So, yeah, Sarah? I, I would also add, um, I don't know if this is working, um, but, uh, that is what we are trying to do. I, we're not going to be perfect the first time out of the gate. Um, but we are trying to bring, to evolve. I love what you were saying about the uh, open kitchen. The open kitchen started in a physical sense of the design of the physical kitchen. I think in the future we are going to have an open kitchen in the digital sense of the, the full supply chain. Yes. And that's what we're moving towards. And so with an independent third party rating that's been verified, we partner with NSF.org uh, to verify the purchasing data that our restaurants give us. Uh, we're hoping that that independent rating will help um, serve as sort of a proxy for trust that you can say, it's not this restaurant that's telling me this, it's this independent third party. And very intentionally, that's why we are a nonprofit, because we wanted to make sure that we were conveying to the chefs that we weren't trying to make money from their data, and we're trying to convey to the eater that we're not a media company that's just trying to profit from the celebrity of chefs. Okay, thank, thank you. you. I, can I just ask one quick question? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, I, I also have been working for a catering company for the last couple of years and, uh, in Connecticut. And there are all these regulations. When we have leftover food, we can no longer donate it. I, I would say that that is mostly a myth. That those, I mean, I'd have to see those regulations, but... Um, prepared food, I should say. Prepared food, we can no longer bring it to the food kitchen like we used to. I'd have to look. I mean, I think that that's a big barrier to donation. Is this I, this perceived um, these perceived regulations that in most cases don't exist? It's a fear of lawsuits and things like that. So, I mean, I'd be happy to help you look into it, okay. but I would push back on that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to our panel.